welcome uh, with the blessing of uh, Bishop uh, Arseni, who welcomes uh, us and hosts us in this beautiful center. Uh, we'll, we'll start our um, evening on Orthodox education worldwide, uh, north and, uh, and south. Um, I'm just introducing um, the, the speakers. The, the evening will be moderated by, uh, by Father John Baer of um, St. Vladimir's Seminary in New York and um, Metropolitan Callistus Weyer, uh, professor in, uh, here at the Freie Universiteit uh, in Amsterdam and he'll be introducing the other two uh, uh, speakers uh, with whom we've been discussing theological education the whole day and uh, with whom we will be discussing um, uh, tomorrow as, uh, as well. Uh, we aim to, st uh, to end at 9 o'clock and have a break in between. But Father John will guide you through the, through the rest of the evening. So, Father John. So, welcome everybody this evening. Your Grace Bishop Polycom, it's good to see you this evening. Thank you for coming. And thank you, Father Michael, for your introduction. So, we're, we've got an evening reflecting on theological education this evening. But actually, it's more specific than that. Um, theological education is clearly vital for the life of the church, for the ongoing life of the church, for the preparation of bishops, priests, deacons, teachers, church leaders in all sorts of different ways. But there's also something more that we can do together in theological education, and that really characterizes the evening as a whole. The oldest lasting division within the church is the division between the Eastern and the Oriental Orthodox. And that is something that you know, we've been reflecting on, working on the two churches greatly over the last century. But it seems to have come to something of a standstill. We've had the various unofficial dialogues between the two churches, the official dialogues between the two churches, the ways in which we've managed to find common statements of faith and agreement of each other's orthodoxy, but taking it forward to the next level, to the next step, seems to be where we start. One of the great ways in which we're able to help move that forward is by education. We've been doing that, as Father Michael mentioned, and the Dean of St. Vladimir Seminary have been the, there since 1993. St. Vladimir started back in 1937, always with a view to pan-Orthodoxy. Initially just pan-Orthodoxy in the Eastern Orthodox sense, but then from the 1950s, 1960s, very much in the Eastern Oriental sense. Our professors, our deans, former deans, were leaders in that dialogue between the two churches. And we also were pioneering in having students from both traditions coming together, studying together. Um, one of the very concrete ways in which that took form was with the Armenian church. We had Armenian students and Armenian professors living on campus, and that's what developed into what is now St. Nurses Armenian Theological Seminary. It initially was a house on our campus, and they moved to a house off our campus, and now they've got a wonderful campus all their own. Um, but we still work together. Their professors are our professors, the classes they teach are classes that are, are accredited by us, their students take our programs. We have been working, living, teaching, training future priests together for the last 30, 40, 50 years. And the intimacy that that has generated is really, really considerable. I've been there since 1993, and during that time, we've had a huge increase in especially Coptic and Malankar students, to the point now that we have a Malankar chapel on campus and a Coptic chapel on campus. His Grace gave us some icons for the Coptic chapel which are beautifully decorating them. So we, we, we now have you know, our three hierarchs chapel where the Eastern Orthodox service take place, but we have a, a Malankar chapel, we have a Coptic chapel where the students have their daily services, we come together at different times. We work together, we live together, the students go off and work in the prisons, in the hospitals, together. 
by working in that way together, we are really concretely working for the future unity of the church. We're preparing priests who know each other, who trust each other, who'll be working alongside each other, and who over the coming generations will be able to bring their people together. That's what it's going to take. It's not going to take just councils of bishops signing formulas together. That's got to be done as well, don't, don't get me wrong. But it requires also this groundwork to be done together. So St. Vladimir has been doing that for quite some time. Um, and in fact, our two Oriental bishops here are both graduates of St. Vladimir's Seminary, so it's good to see you both here this evening. Um, my job also is to moderate the evening and to introduce our speakers. So um, I've mentioned St. Vladimir's Seminary, what we're doing. VU, as you all know, I'm sure everybody here knows about the Amsterdam Center for Orthodox Theology at VU University. That is also consciously and intentionally into Orthodox. Eastern and Oriental. It's, you know, our vision is to work together for the unity of all together. There are two other, but, but you know Vu, the, you know ACOT, we, we've seen each other many times, we'll see each other many other times. Um, the, really, the reason for this evening is because we have two other guests with us this evening who you'll probably not get to know or to hear or to see otherwise. And these two other guests are from schools which are also consciously and intentionally inter-Orthodox. I think we're probably the only schools in the Orthodox world that are deliberately, structurally Eastern Oriental Orthodox in this way. Uh, and so we work, we, we've been meeting together today, we're meeting together tomorrow to see what kind of a joint work it is that we can do, how we can take this work further. But enough from me. Um, it's my really great pleasure now to introduce His Grace Bishop Suriel. Bishop Suriel and I have known each other since the mid to late 90s, so almost 20 years now. Uh, Bishop Suriel was a student at St. Vladimir's Seminary, um, taking classes there while he was uh, a bishop, general bishop in New Jersey. He then got sent to um, Australia to be bishop down in Melbourne. And he is, apart from being one of my closest friends, he is also one of the most creative, ingenious, and entrepreneurial bishops I've ever come across in any tradition whatsoever. He has been working really, really hard for the last 15 years to build up what is now St. Athanasius's College, fully accredited within the University of Divinity in Melbourne, which is a huge accomplishment. It's the first accredited, fully properly accredited college of the Coptic, of the Coptic Church altogether, I think, uh, accredited in the Western world, in the Southern Hemisphere. Um, it's a huge achievement. He's also um, a real estate developer. And if you haven't seen his website and Facebook page with all the pictures of the, the high-rise building going up, which is going to be a huge asset to orthodoxy altogether in Melbourne when it's open later this year and for all the opportunities it will do. So, Your Grace, um, if you'd like to tell us where you've come from, what you're doing, and where you hope to be going with regard to your work with theological education down in Melbourne. Thank you very much, Father Michael, and thank you very much, Father John Beer, for that introduction, I think you give me <laughs> too much credit for uh, the humble work that we're, we're doing in Melbourne. But I'm also very grateful to His Grace Bishop Arseni for giving me the opportunity to be here over the last few days. And very happy to see also His Grace Bishop Polycarpus and did welcome all of you. One of the great modern uh, scholars and saints of the Coptic Orthodox Church at the turn of the 20th century was an archdeacon called Habib Gerdes. And one of his famous sayings was that education was the first need for the community after bread. He had a huge passion for theological education and religious education. He went through a huge struggle in his life to try to achieve the highest possible standards for theological education in the church. Um, he did his best under very difficult circumstances and many 
uh, factors that were tearing at the very thread uh, of Coptic identity, whether it was uh, through Western missionaries that had come to Egypt and began to proselytize the Copts, um, or internal struggles within the church between the lay elite that had begun to be uh, educated through some of the Western uh, missionary education system in Egypt at the time, and the hierarchy of the church that unfortunately was a very bleak and dark period in our modern Coptic history that were predominantly uneducated, and so a lot of clashes took place. And this was the milieu that Habib Gerdus was born into. But uh, really, he's a very inspiring figure in our modern Coptic history. He's a great inspiration for me and for all of the work that I do in the field of theological education that I'm indeed very passionate about. So tonight, I want to share a little bit with you uh, about what we have been doing at St. Athanasius Coptic Orthodox Theological College uh, and to share a little bit with you about the history, what we have done with respect to infrastructure, what courses that uh, we offer, some of the important initiatives that we have taken, uh, and also a great collaboration that is forming or has been forming for several years now, uh, in particular with St. Vladimir's Orthodox Theological Seminary and with the great work that uh, my dear friend Father John Baer uh, is doing uh, there in New York. So uh, the college began its humble beginnings in, in the year 2000. This was probably the first um, major work that I began uh, to do after I was enthroned in Melbourne at the end of 1999. And, uh, his Honest Pope Shenouda III of, of blessed memory gave us the permission to begin a theological college uh, in Melbourne. Um, and this was the letter and the uh, message of blessing that His Honest had written for us. Uh, but before the establishment of the college in 2000, there was a man called Louise Wahba. <clears throat> and he had a passion for theological education for many years and encourage many in Melbourne to begin studying online uh, or through distance education uh, through a college that was established uh, in Sydney uh, prior to the, uh, getting a, a papal decree uh, from Pope Shenouda III to uh, officially recognize a theological college in, in Melbourne. And that's his uh, image there at the bottom. He actually also graduated from that college um, in Sydney. And we had purchased at that time in September of 2000 a Catholic convent, um, and this was the beginning of our uh, theological college. We received that papal decree number 21 over 29, issued by Pope Shenouda, uh, to begin the work. And with our first cohort was about 57 students that were studying part-time. Uh, and we opened our doors in February 2001 after doing major renovations uh, to that building uh, to have it prepared and ready for our first classes. And here you see an image of the building. This was our in initial logo of the college. Uh, and it was attended uh, uh, by several uh, hierarchs, uh, Archbishop uh, Agan Belouzian of blessed memory from the Armenian Church was there at the opening, as well as Metropolitan Bishoy, the Federal Minister of Education, officially opened the building, members of Parliament, um, uh, other clergy from the Syrian Church, um, and, and many other uh, dignitaries that were there. It was a, a joyful and uh, a great beginning for us. This was the small chapel there. We also established uh, a small Orthodox uh, bookshop, but very quickly we outgrew this place within about a year and a half, and we actually sold it, made a, quite a good profit uh, at that time, as uh, Father John mentioned that uh, I seem to get myself involved in some real estate work as well, but it was a good deal. We bought it 
for 875,000 that we sold it for 1.45 million in a year and a half. Not a bad, not a bad profit. Then we, we, we found uh, this beautiful property about 20 minutes out of the Melbourne CBD, uh, which was also owned by the Catholic Church. It was a Carmelite monastery, had some very beautiful grounds, beautiful uh, large building. And we uh, now moved the theological college there and the headquarters of the, of, uh, and the, uh, the headquarters of the diocese and also uh, moved the theological college uh, to this new building. His Honest Pope Shenouda III uh, visited us uh, in November of 2002 uh, and officially uh, opened uh, the building uh, and gave a lecture to our theological college students um, on that occasion. And you can see here some more photos of the grounds, what it looks like. So it's really a place that is con conducive to studying theology, very tranquil area. You wouldn't think that you are in uh, suburban Melbourne, um, but a, a very beautiful site and uh, all of the students uh, enjoy coming to study there. We had some further expansion by uh, converting one wing of the building into two lecture theaters, one for 32 students and one for 48 students, and also um, a student lounge and also a library uh, and an orthodox uh, bookstore. It's not a large library. We're hoping that in the future we can build a large library there, but the current library houses about uh, six and a half thousand volumes. And you can see here some of the images uh, of the current wing of the Theological College. Um, further to this, uh, in 2015, we did some more uh, further renovations. Um, this uh, auditorium where Father John Beer gave a, a very wonderful uh, course to our students uh, on the School of Alexandria spending one week on Origen, one week on St. Athanasius, and one week on St. Cyril of Alexandria. It was the, the largest attended uh, course at the University of Divinity. 72 students studied with Father John, an intensive over three weekends. It was really a very wonderful time. We renovated this hall, and it was named Pope Shenouda III Auditorium and seats about 200 people. We also renovated the top floor of the building uh, for student accommodation, residential accommodation, and that is called St. Pacomius Student Wing, and it has uh, nine uh, rooms, a uh, large student uh, lounge and study area, uh, and we also renovated all of the bathrooms as well so the students can be very comfortable. I'm happy to say that all of those rooms this year are completely full with our students that are uh, studying with us full time and our residential students. And here you can see the, the student lounge and what some of the renovated uh, bedrooms uh, look like. And then, uh, as Father uh, John was also mentioning, that this year we have uh, even expanded further. Um, some people might think that this was a very risky venture. In 2010, um, I was looking at some ways in how I can raise some funds uh, uh, to be able to uh, look after the needs of the Theological College, because it is a very expensive venture to to have a theological college that operates properly and um, we found three buildings that were in the uh, center of uh, melbourne business district um, two of them were for sale and the smaller one uh, that was there not yet available and it uh, has a four street frontage which is very rare in melbourne <coughs> So we started negotiating. It was owned by a Jewish man who was gay. He had AIDS. He was dying. And the 
developers came in, wanted to buy the two buildings. Obviously, there was a boom in building skyscrapers in Melbourne at the time. But this man preferred to give it to the church at a slightly lower cost. I don't know why till now, but he did. Anyway, we bought the two buildings. Initially, we said, we'll take one, we'll use it as the church. We had a city mission church at the time that we had begun. And we said, well, we might sell that second building. The parish priest there was previously a very successful businessman. He had many of his friends that were interested to buy that middle building. But a few weeks later, the third building went for auction. It was the smallest of the three of about 200 square meters. Developers were not interested to buy it because they couldn't build a skyscraper on it. And I said to Father Mark at the time, you must find some way for us to find the businessman that would buy that on our behalf and then we, we can settle and return that money back to them at some stage. So we had three buildings, we had the island block and started to think what we're going to do with it and then we came up with this idea why don't we build uh, a skyscraper and that's exactly what we did. We built a 44 story skyscraper um, right smack in the center of Melbourne, Father John, when he was there, saw the building when it was almost complete. It is now uh, finished, except for our levels. You'll see there that cross in the middle. Um, where that horizontal black line is, is where our levels end. So we own four and a half levels of that building. On ground level, there is some retail space that will be leased out, so it will bring back an income for the Theological College to be able to spend on, obviously, salaries and all the needs of the college. And there is also an Orthodox bookstore that will be there on ground level. As you can see on the next level, those stained glass windows, um, there is six beautiful six stained glass windows because we've built a church into the tower that seats about 360 people with a mezzanine level and will all be decorated with beautiful Coptic iconography. Um, there is some uh, apartments for guest lecturers that will come. Um, there is also a function center, industrial kitchen, and on our top level are four state-of-the-art lecture theaters that will seat about 200 students, can open up to a large auditorium, there will be a conference room, my office will be there, and some offices uh, for my staff. In the, if you notice on the right side, the color of the glass is a bit different because it is uh, clear on the right side, whereas the other glass has Coptic crosses on it, because uh, that's about uh, 15 meters high, where a beautiful Coptic mosaic will be in the foyer, which will speak uh, about the history of the Coptic Church or certain epochs of the history. It will contain 500,000 pieces of mosaic uh, in that uh, uh, piece of art and that will be uh, completed very soon. About half of it is completed now. But these four and a half levels uh, will be finished uh, by June this year. <coughs> So I think that we really put the Coptic Orthodox Church on the map in Melbourne and beyond and especially will enhance the work of our theological college, we'll have a very prominent position. The University of Divinity, who we are a part of, are looking at this and they are in amazing they, amazement, they don't understand how we did it, even though that we are a small community compared to uh, other immigrant churches that have been there for over a hundred years. There are about uh, 15,000 Copts in Melbourne. Um, and so they look at this and are in wondering how did the Copts uh, achieve this, but they forget sometimes that we are the sons of the pharaohs. <laughs> <laughs> so this is the actual building. So you can see what it looks like uh, when it's complete now. That green part on the left is uh, the retail shops that I just heard this morning have finally been uh, leased. So this will begin bringing in some income uh, in the coming months. The gray area that you can see there on the right of the building, this is seven levels of car parking. So there's actually two elevators at the back of the building. 
that the cars go in and they take them up uh, to their car, uh, to their level where they can park their cars because the site would be either while well, it's too small for the cars to go around. So this is the infrastructure that we have been doing since we've established the college. The other thing that we have been working on in the past is uh, several important academic symposia. The first one happened in 2002 when Carl Inemey was there. He's on the left there, he's with us tonight. Uh, was on St. Athanasius and Christian tradition. Uh, and we had some of the prominent scholars, and I remember Charles Canning Geiser, who was speaking there. He's been studying St. Athanasius for about 30 years, and his wife had been studying St. Anthony uh, also for several decades. There were many scholars, as you can see, many people came to attend uh, uh, this symposium. In 2003, we had uh, another symposium on St. Cyril of Alexandria. Uh, in fact, uh, Father John Anthony McGuckin was going to come uh, to speak, but he fell ill at the time. He's one of the leading scholars on St. Cyril and wrote an important uh, uh, book on him. In 2007, we had a symposium uh, on monasticism, which was also very well attended. And in 2013, we had a symposium on St. Severus of Antioch, his life and times, and the proceedings of that symposium uh, were published by Brill uh, last year uh, in 2016. And also, I should tell you a little bit about the accreditation process. This was uh, not something easy for us. Um, it was a very long and arduous process uh, that took about three years. It began in 2009. Um, and we had to go through a long process to accredit our uh, faculty and to make sure that we have enough facilities to make sure that our library was adequate uh, to begin uh, teaching. Um, and then finally, uh, on the 7th of December 2011, uh, our theological college was officially accredited as a recognized teaching institution of the University of Divinity. At that time, it was called the Melbourne College uh, of Divinity. And as Father John mentioned, that we uh, are the first Coptic Orthodox theological college uh, in the world to have received such accreditation. And I remember that day very well. It was a very joyful day for our college. We couldn't believe that we had finally achieved this, but we knew that this was only the beginning of still a very long journey. We were accredited to teach an undergraduate award, a diploma in theology, I'll speak about the awards that we teach uh, currently in a few moments. A little bit about the University of Divinity. It started out as the Melbourne College of Divinity and uh, came into effect in 1910 through an act of parliament uh, through the Victorian government at the time. So they celebrated the centenary just a few years ago. It's 11 member colleges. It's an ecumenical body. So there is Catholic, Protestant, Anglican, Salvation Army. We are the only Orthodox colleges part of the University of Divinity. Each college's theology and traditions are respected and value, uh, valued, and the university does not interfere uh, in the theology of each of the denominations, but its role, obviously, is to administer and make sure that each college is at the proper academic standards uh, and its faculty have the uh, accreditation and the qualifications to teach at the level uh, that they are teaching at. And also our, our college is actively represented in all the university boards and committees uh, and included in the leadership uh, of the university as well. So this was not an easy thing to be able to achieve. <coughs> A little bit about the awards that we offer. We offer uh, two undergraduate awards currently. 
So after we were accredited for the Diploma in Theology on campus, um, which is eight units of study, each unit of study is 36 hours of lecture time, and this commenced in 2012. And then we were uh, given permission as our faculty began to grow to also teach an advanced diploma in theology and ministry, which is 16 units of study that commenced last year. Both of those awards are also taught fully online. So that means anyone around the world can study with us currently. And in fact, we do have students from many different parts around the world, from the UK, uh, from the US, from Canada, um, from Jerusalem, um, and from many of the different states in Australia and in New Zealand. So both of these awards are available for online study. These are our current undergraduate awards. And postgraduate awards began this year. We have three awards currently, a graduate certificate in theology, and the Graduate Certificate in Divinity, each are three units. And these can be taken and then someone can continue studying if they want to, to a master's degree or a, a diploma in theology. Um, and th these units that they study can be folded into those awards. So we also teach a, a graduate diploma in theology, which is six units of study. All these three awards began this year. Our next step that we hope to achieve throughout this year is to be able to next year um, offer uh, a Master of Divinity, which would be a three-year degree, a uh, Master of Arts and Theology. We're also working in 2019 towards a, Cop a, a Master's of Coptic Studies, because this field is becoming less and less prevalent in universities. There was a Master of Coptic Studies at Macquarie University in Sydney, but that has almost folded now. So we're hoping to be able to take that lead. And in fact, looking at uh, establishing a research center for Coptic Studies, and it will be housed in our new campus in the city. And we also hope to be able to uh, uh, offer a doctoral program next year as well. Both of uh, these two awards, the Graduate Certificate in Theology and Divinity and the Graduate Diploma in Theology are all available for online study. And then a little bit about uh, SAC Press, uh, St. Athanasius College Press. It is a fledgling press, a very small press. We're just beginning to test the waters and see what we can do with this. And also our relationship with uh, the very successful and uh, 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 amazing St. Vladimir Seminary Press, the leading Orthodox press in the world. They have published now, I think, over 500 books. Um, and last year, through uh, my relationship with Father John Baer, we were able to establish a Coptic study series within SVS Press. So it's, uh, this series is published jointly uh, with SAC Press. Uh, and uh, the first book has come out last year, perhaps some of you have seen it, which is The Life of Repentance and Purity uh, by Pope Shenouda III of Blessed Memory. This was my uh, translation of this work and uh, it was a new edition, had a lot of important footnotes of many of the references, patristic quotes that Pope Shenouda used but he did not actually reference in his Arabic edition. And so we were able to find the majority of those and add them so people could uh, refer back to them. And we had a book launch in uh, New York and then a second book launch when Father John Baer uh, was with us in Melbourne uh, last year. So this is the first volume in this new Coptic Studies series. The second volume uh, in the Coptic Studies series will be launched next month. And this is my work on Archdeacon Habib Gerdes, which was uh, the work of my doctoral dissertation. And the title of that book is Habib Gerdes, Coptic Orthodox Educator and a Light in the Darkness. It will be available through both SBS Press, SAC Press, and also will be available through uh, Amazon. 
our college also has a, a great interest in Coptic iconography. We're actually very lucky to have, in my opinion, the world leader in Coptic iconography, and this is uh, Ashraf Faye. Um, he does some amazing work. You can see some of his beautiful iconography there. That icon uh, he painted or wrote at uh, uh, St. Mark's Church in uh, Cleveland, Ohio. So he, he is very well known and has done uh, lots of work all throughout uh, uh, the world. And currently he's completing all of the artwork uh, that is going in our new tower, the Poro Tower. <clears throat> he's the disciple of Dr. Isaac Fanous, who came and studied in uh, Europe. Can't remember which country, maybe Carl may, may, may uh, remember. Uh, but he really was very talented. He did a master's degree uh, in iconography and also, also teaches uh, both the theology of icons and also the practical side of actually writing an icon and many students of our theological college are very fascinated by this and have learned so many skills with him. And so we offer several uh, units in Coptic iconography as well. Recent significant events. In 2016, we had a very important event uh, when His Holiness Patriarch Irenae, the Patriarch of the Serbian Orthodox uh, Church, on the 8th of March visited our theological college um, and gave uh, an important lecture uh, about theology as a hope for the future of the church. Uh, we had the Vice Chancellor of the University there, uh, the Greek Orthodox bishops in Melbourne were in attendance with us, and many of the heads of colleges uh, and many of our students and staff were present on this uh, very important occasion. As I mentioned, in 2016, we had a winter intensive, and we found that these intensives are becoming very popular because it means a short period of time of study. Yes, they do the full 36 hours of, uh, of uh, lectures, uh, but they don't have to spend the whole semester uh, attending classes, and then they write the papers that they need. They engage with top scholars like Father John Baer, um, and so we are lucky to be able to have such scholars to come to Melbourne. I know it's a long distance, but it really makes a, a great impact on our students. Our students still remember what they have learned from Father John. I remember a couple of weeks ago attending a Sunday school or a youth meeting, and uh, the, the youth leader who was leading was actually speaking about some of the material that Father John Baer uh, had taught them uh, the previous year, and I was very impressed to see that this was happening. It was the largest number of enrollments across the university last year at this winter intensive. These are some of our faculty and staff. We have 12 full-time faculty and staff, and about 14 sessional uh, and visiting faculty. And our faculty areas cover Coptic, Hebrew, Greek, Arabic, Old and New Testament studies, systematic theology, liturgical studies, sacramental theology, Coptic studies, history, patristics, monasticism, art and archaeology, iconography, moral theology, religious education, youth ministry, Christian counseling, homiletics, pastoral care, and Christian leadership. So you can see a wide variety, and we are of courses and units, and we are continually uh, increasing the offerings that we can uh, present uh, to our students. And among the staff, there are a number of visiting international scholars. We're happy that uh, Professor Carl Inamay will come and to teach uh, second semester at our theological college also. Among our staff, we have a chaplain, we have a coursework coordinator, executive assistant to the dean, a director of academic administration, a director of marketing, a person responsible for multimedia and IT, and also uh, a librarian. This shows you uh, a very uh, uh, quick overview of the uh, structure of the, of the college. So you can see we have a board of governors, 
We have a, fin a finance advisory uh, committee. We have the council that makes all the major decisions within that council. There's strategic planning, budget approval, policy approval, strategic partnerships, just like what we were uh, doing some of today in our discussions with various orthodox colleges around the world. We have a management committee, an academic board that approves all of our courses. Then you can see several other committees under that, a marketing committee, student committee, library, academic administration, research committee, learning uh, and teaching committee. So this is our uh, college uh, structure. Some of the unit offerings, we offer more than uh, uh, 40 units. And I uh, mentioned some of these things that we uh, currently teach at the Theological College in Melbourne. In semester one this year, we have 90 student enrollments. They are predominantly studying part-time in the evening. Enrolled in 154 units, which is our largest semester ever, so it seems we are continuing to grow and I think when we are in the city campus the college will continue to grow further. We have three full-time residential students this year, eight full-time students but not all living on, on campus. And this is a, an image of our graduation ceremony from uh, last year. This uh, pie chart you can see a little bit about our students by location but it gives you an idea that we've got students from Victoria, South Australia, West Australia, New South Wales, Queensland, Canberra, UK, USA, Israel, Canada, and we have one Korean pastor, Protestant pastor from South Korea who is auditing with us this semester, studying Coptic, interested in Coptic manuscripts, I think is going to come back and do a higher degree with us at some stage. Upcoming initiatives, we have a very important conference that we're looking forward to next year, an international <laughs> conference titled Cops and Modernity, which will look at uh, all of the life of the Copts and the Coptic Church, language, all aspects uh, of Coptic life from the 18th to the 21st century, and this will take place from the 13th to the 18th of July uh, next year. We are going to also launch this year St. Habib Gerge Student Review. We're going to take some of the top papers that our students have written and we will publish two volumes per year at the end of each uh, semester and this I hope will be also an encouragement for our students uh, to present the best work that they can and we are also working on an academic journal uh, that I hope can be uh, published at some time in the future. So, thank you for your attention. I hope that this gives you a bit of an overview of what has been happening at St. Athanasius College since its establishment in 2001. Thank you. So now it's my pleasure to introduce uh, uh, Michael Yell. Do I pronounce it right? Yes, yes. 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 Um, from, from Sweden, uh, of uh, St. Ignatius Academy. Uh, which is actually a, also a sister institute in the sense that, that they're also the, both orthodox families are represented. Uh, so to, today we were sitting and discussing also with Bishop Suriel uh, the, the, the challenges but also the opportunities of, for, of working together and uh, we're of course very inter interested to hear uh, about the work you've been doing in, uh, in Sweden. So, Michael? Yeah. Thank you so much for Michael. Michael or Michael? Yeah. Oh. Whatever you want. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'm very pleased to be here in Amsterdam. It's the first time I'm in Amsterdam and I've been here before. I'm surprised that it's so beautiful. Uh, and I'm happy to see also uh, Archbishop uh, uh, Polycarpus. He's more known for me as Eddie because I've met him when he was a student at St. Larry's. And I'm very happy also to uh, meet with Bishop Suri for the first time. Uh, my story will not be as uh, elaborate and uh, beautiful as Bishop Suri. 
I will instead go back to the history of Sweden and, and Orthodox, Orthodox in Sweden. But just some few comments upon St. Ignatius Institution. We were established 2010 as a center for Orthodox studies, for Eastern Christian studies and culture. And then 2012, we, uh, the bish four bishops founded uh, Sancti Natius Foundation, uh, two Byzantine bishops and two Oriental bishops. And then 2016, uh, last year, we were accredited uh, both as an academy and as a college. And it virtually exploded from, I don't remember now, 10 students to 385 students in one year. So you guess, you understand that I'm quite busy at the moment <laughs> in just having this explosion. And it was needed because uh, the system is winning depending on how many students you have. You gain money from the number of students. Most of the students are at the college level. Uh, just a few now are at the academy level, simply because we started last year, and they start in the college. Uh, we, the institution has a primary task is to facilitate Eastern Christian studies. The secondary or parallel task is to facilitate unity between the Eastern Orthodox and Oriental Orthodox churches through studies. And the third thing is to educate a new generation of leaders, both bishops, priests, and teachers, Elfona and Marigita. Uh, we also offer a degree, uh, Sankt Nenatis Order, which the second year was uh, given to uh, Pope Tavadros, and the third year it was given to Hadjak uh, Sir Afrin Karim. And uh, the fourth year, it was given to Metropolitan Porfiri of Croatia. Uh, Pope Varus received the prize for his uh, focus on supporting uh, studies uh, by uh, uh, revigorating studies in Coptic Church again. Pope, uh, uh, Patrick Sirach and Green received the prize because of his eager effort as an Archbishop of America to facilitate uh, uh, Eucharistic communion for everyone. And Metropolitan Porfi received the prize for his effort uh, to promote uh, uh, peace and reconciliation between Croatians and Serbs in uh, present day Croatia. And next year we will have an announcement of the new receiver of a prize. That will be a secret, <laughs> not the next week. <coughs> Uh, anyway, if we go back to history, this is actually the first Orthodox parish in uh, the diaspora. The Orthodox Holy Transfiguration Church is a Russian parish and is, has been uh, existing in Sweden since 1617. 1617. And this is the entrance of the present church today. It's located in uh, the city of Stockholm. Uh, it was established uh, when the Peace of Stalbova between Swedes and Russians was established. Uh, the Russians were given the right in paragraph 15 that Russians were allowed to have services on Swedish soil in Viborg, that's part of Russia today, and in Stockholm. And in 1617 it was located at the Russian trade station the old city of Stockholm. And <clears throat> 1907 it has its present uh, location that you see in the picture. 1921 it was uh, moved from under St. Uh, Petersburg uh, to Paris because of uh, certain uh, events in uh, Russia, partly the Russian Revolution but there were more reasons. And then it was transferred to the Ecumenic Patriarchate 1931. So this is uh, the oldest parish in actually the Western diaspora. But the history of Orthodoxy goes way back in Sweden to the so-called Variaks. Variaks is more known as Vikings. You know them as Vikings, but in the annuals in Sweden they're called Variaks. 
The variacs are uh, we have the major story about the variacs is uh, in the primary chronicles, Nestor's Kronika in Swedish, where we have a story about the foundation of the Russian kingdom. In the year 1859, the variacs came over the sea and gathered payment from Estonians, uh, Zlyogars, Marians, Vesen, Krivetians. In the year 862, they were driven away back over the sea. No payment was given, and the Estonians and others ruled themselves. And justice was lost, tribe rose against tribe, great disorder and quarrels arose, and they started a fight among themselves. And they said to one another, let us find a prince who will rule over us and bring justice. And they went back over the sea to the Variax, Varige. <clears throat> they were also called Russes. Like others were called Svealanders, other Norlanders, uh, others Angles, others Gotlanders, and they said to the Russes, Our land is big and wide, but without any order. Come and rule over us and be our princes. And three brothers were chosen from among them, and they took all the Russes with them and came. The oldest, Rurik, stayed in Novgorod. The second oldest, Sinas, went to White Lake, and the third, Truvor sent to Irboska. Uh, Russia got, it, got its name from these Russes. In two years, Sinevs and Truvor died, and Rurik took the whole country, giving his men towns. To one Polotsk, to another Rostov, to a third White Lake. To these towns, the Varyaks came. Earlier, they lived in Novgorod, Slovens, in Polotsk, the Kirilich, in Rostov, the Marians, in White Lake, the Ves, in Muron, the Muramers. They were all ruled by Rurik. So, where does the name Rus come from? It comes from a part in Sweden, it's called Ruslagen, and it's just located north of Stockholm. And it comes from an ancient Swedish word meaning Ru, and Ru means row in English. So, the people who were rowing across the lake, so to say, that is the name of the Russia. It's an ancient Swedish word. And if we look at the map, so let's see if we can point it. This is Ruslagen, just above Stockholm. And the Vikings or the Variaks were traveling across the land and established several kingdoms, not one, but several kingdoms, out of which one is known for us as the Rusland, uh, Russia, in fact. Uh, and after the Vikings more or less disappeared, uh, the first Christian king was Olaf Skjørkonen, the, the Olaf the treasurer, and uh, he established strong connections with Jaroslav the Vice, and actually gave away his daughter in marriage, Inge Jav, who took the name Irina in Russian, and, and later on she became a nun just before she passed away, and was later on Saint Anna, declared the first saint from West, in fact. And this is an icon for my home parish. Uh, that is, uh, I think it's an OCA web page, it's also the same icon, in fact. During the 12th and 13th century, we know that Russian settlements were existing in Sikhtuna, the heart of Ruslogen, and in Visby. And Visby is the island, if you don't know it, this is the island of Visby. It was a, a trade settlement for Russians, and we know that we actually had a parish there before the uh, Orthodox Transfiguration Parish. And this is a painting uh, trying to reconstruct how the church was looking at the 14th century. And you see it's a village of Visby, and in the middle there was a Russian church, uh, uh, along with a uh, Russian trade station. So, orthodoxy in Sweden was primarily Russian orthodoxy until the 20th century. And then we had refugees. And the first refugees came in 1944 with the Metropolitan Alexander of Estonia, who made his exile uh, avoiding the communists, with 23 priests and deacons and settled in Stockholm. But he never had jurisdiction of Sweden. He was just, had, uh, just a, a exile bishop. 
<coughs> his jurisdiction was for Estonia. But when he died, uh, his grace Jure Velbi was consecrated the bishop 1953 for Estonians and for Sweden. So he's the first Swedish Orthodox bishop that we have. And when Velbe dies in 1961, the Estonian parishes are integrated in local dioceses of ecumenical patriarchate. And suddenly we don't have an Estonian bishop anymore. And instead we get the first uh, Byzantine bishop in uh, Sweden. Polyeftos Pifinis, who was consecrated in uh, 1969 and was followed by Metropolitan Paulus in 1974. And today, 2014, we have His Eminence Cleopas Stromvilis of the Greek Orthodox Metropolis in Sweden. In 1990, uh, the Serum of the Church received its first uh, bishop of Britain and Scandinavia, His Grace Dosite, who celebrates the liturgy in our picture. And he was followed uh, in 2008 by the Romanian Orthodox Bishop, uh, His Grace Makaria of Nor Northern Europe, in exact Scandinavia. Because Finland is a uh, Byzantine canonical country. But the fastest growing community today in Sweden is the Greek Orthodox Church of Antio because of the recent immigrant stream to Sweden. We don't know how many because it's so recent, but they arrived, we know at least that. It's about 10,000 years driving in the recent years. So it's a fast growing community. And they have a new head of a new diocese. He's not uh, yet consecrated bishop. It's Father Jean Manzoul, a little man on the picture, <laughs> besides one of his deacons. And he is actually also the new rector for the Byzantine seminary uh, at St. Ignatius. The Oriental side, if you look at that side, the first Oriental Orthodox Bishop was His Eminence Metropolitan Timotheus Afrem Abudi, who resided from 1977. So, the first Oriental Bishop was His Eminence uh, Metropolitan Timotheus Afrem Abudi, who resided from 1977 in Sertelli, the Syriac Orthodox Diocese of Scandinavia and Great Britain. Uh, later, in 1986, the diocese was divided in two, with Scandinavia as a separate diocese, and His Eminence Metropolitan Juris Abdullahad Galashava replaced His Eminence to Mutis Afram in Sertelli. In 1994, the diocese was divided in two due to a, a very complicated schism, uh, with the effect of two parallel parishes in almost every major city in Sweden. His Eminence Metropolitan Diospolis Benjamin Atash uh, became a parallel bishop in Sweden. Uh, and in 2009, His Grace Bishop Abaki of the Coptic Diocese of Scandinavia joined the Syriac Orthodox Bishops. Not coming up. Oh. Something happens. No. Yes. yes. Okay. I will hold this. <laughs> <laughs> If you compare them, the numbers uh, we have in uh, Sweden, uh, one eighth of Orthodox in US. But if you can compare the number of inhabitants in America in comparison with Sweden, you realize it's quite a huge community in Sweden that we have. But more interesting is that 52% of all uh, our Orthodox in Sweden are Oriental Orthodox. Actually, one of the few countries that we have a majority that is Oriental Orthodox. Uh, and if we compare it even more, 40% of all uh, Orthodox in Sweden are Syriac Orthodox. And no country in the world, except for India, of course, counts as many Syriac Orthodox in one country in comparison with the rest of Orthodox. It's the only country where the Syriac Orthodox Church is the leading Orthodox Church. And that's a great responsibility, carrying uh, such a leadership within the Orthodox Churches. Mm. But then we have the scandal. No. Yeah. The scandal. Let's see now. Yeah. In 451, we had the Oriental Orthodox and Byzantine Orthodox separate from each other. 
and the BCD became known as Vasiliski or Melkites, and Orientals became known as Monophysites. And we had these huge conflicts within, I continue now, <laughs> huge conflict uh, in uh, uh, church history. The conflict was quite asymmetrical and in the hands of emperor. And from the Byzantine time, I'm self Byzantine, we can reflect upon the situation simply that it was a kind of oppression of the adversaries in this conflict. Constantinople II, 553, tried to breach the schist, but then the non Chalcedonian side had been severely mistreated by the emperor. And there was no real uh, possibility for a reconciliation. <coughs> Anyway, uh, until the 13th century, there was no real attempts of reconciliation. But we have a beautiful uh, saying by Vare Groyo, Vare Brios, in the 13th century, when he reflects uh, upon uh, the division uh, among Christians. And it says, When I had given my thoughts and meditation to this business during some time, I became convinced that these quarrels of Christians among themselves are not a matter of facts, but of words and denominations. For all of them confess Christ our Lord to be holy God and holy man, without mixture, nivellation, or mutation of nature. This bilateral likeness is called by some nature, by other persons, by others, hypostasis. So I saw all the Christian peoples notwithstanding these differences, possessing one unvarying equality, and I wholly eradicated the root of hatred from the depth of my heart, and I absolutely forsook disputation with anyone concerning confession. Bari Royal, the 13th century. This is an important statement by him, because it, it reflects that there was kind of a deep understanding already during the 13th century that this conflict <coughs> was not a real Christological conflict, in the full sense. In the 20th century, so it took quite a while between Barbroio and the 20th century, uh, Father Nikos Nisiotis and Father Paul Vergese began working on unity in their work in the uh, Christian Con uh, World Council of Churches. And they worked extensively, so it ended in 1993 with a common agreement on Christology. Uh, for me, when I was starting my work at St. Neotius, I realized nothing had happened since 1993. You know, all the major scholars agree that we have the same Christology, but nothing happens. And unfortunately, I have to say, the fault is mainly on the bishops, <laughs> sitting in front of, <laughs> talking in front of bishops. <laughs> Not because the bishop hasn't done anything simply because the bishops hasn't taken in consideration to change the curriculum of studies, incorporating these ideas into the ordinary studies of schools. Instead, there's some few schools, and as we have seen today, it's just four schools, as Father John said, that actually has a clear aim of inter cooperation. With such an effect as having a common statement of Christology, it should have reflected the entire change of orthodoxy. If God exists, and some of us really believe he exists, it means that we have an obligation to take such a challenge seriously. We have to reflect upon the need for uh, sustaining a new way of addressing an insight such as this. So, <coughs> now it's coming. It's something else. Oh. Anyway, <clears throat> uh, so when the four bishops, Bishop, uh, Archbishop uh, Dioscorus, Bishop Makani, Bishop Dostey, and Bishop Auki signed the statutes uh, of the foundation of St. Knott's Theological Academy, the 5th of October 2012, the intention was to uh, make an is, uh, to establish an institution committed towards unity between Oriental Orthodox and Eastern Orthodox. It has been quite a hard work to be doing. There's a lot of resistance in the world, not least among monks. 
and not least among the Coptic Church monk and the Russian Orthodox Church monks. And why? And I think that uh, the predecessor of Father John, John H. Erickson, he said it very bluntly, uh, division has its own life. People believe that division is, you know, given by God. God has actually divided the church at uh, the Council of 451. And this has created the situation that we are in. So, <clears throat> uh, with this objective in mind, we started to establish a school of theology. From the very beginning, uh, studies in parishes, to bachelor degree, to master degree, and doctor degree. And we committed ourselves to do it 2014, and merged with the Stockholm School of Theology in Sweden, 2014, and gained our accreditation as an academy and as a college last year, 2016. Uh, today, it's a center, uh, St. Knox Academy is a center for Eastern Christian Studies within the Stockholm School of Theology, which is uh, one of three schools in Stockholm. We have the Stockholm School of Economics, the Stockholm School of Technology, and then the Stockholm School of Theology. The two previous ones gives a Nobel Prize. We don't have Nobel Prize in theology yet, so that's diff uh, different. The Academy offers studies for bachelor, master, or doctor in Eastern Christian studies. We have one part-time professor from the next academic year, four senior lecturers, and one adjunct. Psychonauts College is directly owned by the Foundation and offers training in languages in Greek, Coptic, Gaius, Church Slavonic, Hebrew, and classical Syriac Orthodox, as well as education training for parish teachers and priest candidates. Right, it's coming in randomly. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we have 21 teachers today at the college, part time and full time. And we have, as I said previously, now it's <laughs> two purposes uh, unity and studies six programs and 385 uh, students. Uh, we work to promote Eastern Christian studies and education and to promote unity between Eastern Orthodox and Oriental Orthodox churches. Four educational programs, uh, one pre-seminary school, one seminary year, one pastor program, one year for deacons, and two years and four years for priest candidates, including a bachelor. We have a pedagogical program, six years from Malfano, Marigeta, and Pedagogos, including bachelor and master, and languages are included in this. And we have three academic programs, one bachelor, three years, one master, one and two years. Bachelor is a common curriculum for all traditions. So it means that you gain an, uh, a bachelor in theology with a major in Eastern Christian studies, while the master is a master in theology and then you can have a uh, major in Syriac Christian Studies, or Coptic Christian Studies, or Tewahedo Christian Studies, or Byzantine Christian Studies. And then finally, we have a doctoral program, four years, and then you go back again to Eastern Christian Studies, focusing on either patristics, biblical studies, or ecclesiology or liturgics. Bedankt voor het luisteren <laughs> My name is uh, Elham Khalil. Uh, I'm uh, 47 years here in uh, Holland. And I will have a question. Uh, it bothers me, in fact, my whole life. Uh, I came to Holland as, and I thought, uh, it's a Christian country, but uh, I found out uh, uh, harshly enough uh, lately that uh, it's not. How can we uh, address the most important challenge? Maybe it's more challenging than uh, combining our uh, Eastern and Oriental uh, churches. Uh, that would be easier. Uh, but how can we uh, address the most important challenge we have of uh, atheism or the, uh, the non-believers or the not-knowings? the people who doesn't know. Uh, the, 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 this can be addressed in a kind of, uh, not only a subject, or, or, or uh, to be, to be uh, not pamphleted in, in one paper, but it has to be a kind of study, uh, and not addressing only 
the people who address it, we are interested in the church, but how can we uh, address to the people outside? That's, is it in Europe, in Holland, in England, or in Australia, or Canada, or in America? How can we address, do we have in our uh, precious uh, colleges in Amsterdam, or Melbourne, or uh, the States, uh, 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 studies specialized in addressing this particular problem? I think really the, the work that the theological colleges are doing are really very significant and very important to um, educate the leaders that will care for the upcoming generations in, in Western countries in particular. Um, and we must not uh, uh, minimize the work that they're doing because it's very critical and very important because if we don't have strong leaders right then who's going to lead the church coming in the future so you know to have strong youth leaders sunday school teachers that educate the children you know uh, priests that are well educated that can meet these challenges that can study these things at theological college so that they are well equipped to be able to meet with these challenges doesn't mean they'll be able to solve everything, obviously not, but at least, you know, having that uh, atmosphere where they can engage in some of these dialogues and discussions is going to make them better equipped to be able to assist our young people how to meet with some of the challenges that they meet every day. But with this issue of atheism, you know, atheism has its ebbs and flows all throughout history, so this is something that uh, I don't think it's something that we need to emphasize too, too much upon. But the important thing is how we witness to Christ in the way that we live, in the way that we teach and nurture our children and the upcoming generations, and that to serve them properly pastorally, I think this is the main role of the church. Um, I want to second everything that Bishop Sir has just said. At uh, St. Vladimir's, at our other theological schools, we do indeed spend a great deal amount of time, energy, and reflection on contemporary questions that challenge us all today. But actually, I think some, we do something which is even more important. If we think that the problems of today are difficult enough, the problems that we're preparing our students to address are the problems of 20 or 30 or 40 years down the road. You know? If you just think how much our world has changed over the last 20, 30 years, yeah. imagine what it would be like another 20, 30, 40 years' time. And that's what we're preparing our students for. Not to solve the world's problems today, but to be ready to respond to whatever might happen thereafter. Yeah. Um, but one further element in this also is that, as befits the theme this evening, we have to work together for the unity of our churches in order to be able to bear a common witness to the world in all of us. My name is Adrian Lim. I have a question about uh, the unity of, between um, the Eastern Orthodox and the Oriental Orthodox. Um, one of you, you mentioned about the barrier in this unity. Can you tell me what is the specific barriers? <laughs> Very easy. <laughs> um, well, then, no, no, maybe not so, so easy. But we, 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 we can be precise as we said. So we have had theological discussions between the churches over the last century. We've had any number of conferences, investigations of what Cyril said, what, of what Severus said, of what post calcedonian writers said, at the highest possible level. And we have come to an agreement that really they were trying to say the same thing, the same truth in different ways. What um, is more difficult to overcome than scholars or bishops talking among themselves is any number of other facts. The fact, for instance, that we've been anathematizing each other for the last 1,500 years. <laughs> that is much, much more difficult to overcome. The fact that you know, um, the Oriental saints are our heretics and our, her our saints are their heretics. And that's been so for 1,500 years, 1,400 years. What do you do with that? That's really difficult. One of the main things to overcome all of that is simply getting to know each other to start off with. And mm -hmm. that's why 
working together with the young people, bringing them together to be educated together, to go out and work together, is really where the change is going to come. One could multiply other examples of that kind of division, you know, that we haven't been talking to each other for 1,500 years. So you, you mean uh, it's about acceptance? Yeah, from both and, and the fact that for 1,500 years we've been living, I mean, obviously we've been you know, impinging upon each other in different ways, but it's coming to know each other again in that, yeah, beyond the academic theologians or the highest level bishops coming together, the people coming together. One important aspect also is uh, it's, it's a spiritual problem. Uh, think about apostatize Christ. Nobody would do it. You know, people would rather die. <laughs> but think if someone gets in his or her mind that actually we have all that is needed for unity in terms of dogmatic things, then we have responsibility. We can't deny the work for unity. But it seems that people have, you know, have a hard time to accept that we are responsible once we get into our minds that we should be united. Then it's, then it's a spiritual thing. The second thing is power. I'm, the business, I'm a business team, and I think that the business inside has a great responsibility because they have used the secular power in support of oppressing the Oriental churches through history. It means when a Byzantine scholar, when, whether he or she is uh, Russian, Greek, or Romanian, whatever, once you accept we have the same Christology, it's a misrepresentation, there are possibilities for unity, then you're obliged, according to your conscience, according to your existence as a scholar, to uh, turn away from such an opportunity, from my perspective, it's the same. It's an apostasize of the work of Christ. And this is something that I deem spiritual. I have a question. <laughs> um, because we've already been discussing today the common problems, uh, and, and of course one of the things we realize being in the diaspora, the two families, that we have so much in common. And actually, for our believers, it's impossible to explain what is actually dividing us. Ask any of, of our believers, and they find it very difficult to express uh, what is it all uh, about. And what we know, we feel that we share the same faith. And also the outside world, they think <laughs> we're, the, we're the same. Uh, so, so there is a, a, quite a challenge. Uh, there is also the, the challenge for us, for our communities, that we need clergy. And we notice today that basically uh, in, in, in Australia, uh, but I think also in, in, in Sweden, and also in, in, in here in Holland, we need no, new, fresh Orthodox clergy. And, and here, we, we've been thinking, going back to St. Paul, who also had a very manual job, besides uh, preaching, whether we, we have to create a possibility for, for our clergy to have uh, a job and work in the church. We have to be creative, <coughs> because a full-time priest, that's in, in our uh, situation quite rare. So I'm, I'm, I'm interested to know what what in in Australia what you're doing and the situation in Sweden and maybe even in the in the states. So can I ask you first, uh, Bishop? Sir? Yeah, thank you. thank you for that question. I think for us uh, as Copts, we try we tend to shy away from that idea that we would have a priest that would have a secular job and then do his priestly ministry on the weekends because. We feel like there is so much pastoral work to be done for our people, visiting the sick, visiting people in, in their homes, Bible studies that may be done during the week, other work that the priest needs to do. And I think it really uh, takes from the essence of what it means to be a priest, that he should be there, a person for his people, out there serving them, caring for their needs on a regular basis. So in my diocese, I think in the majority 
uh, of Coptic diocese that our, all of our clergy are full-time doing their, their priestly ministry. I've got the experience of um, living in two very, very different worlds with regard to this. So I grew up in England, um, in the Moscow Patriarchate. My father was a priest, he was a priest in the, in the Polish Orthodox Church. Uh, he was ordained by Metropolitan Anthony. And the world of Orthodoxy I grew up in, in, with in England, probably no parish was ever more than 50, 50 families. The cathedral in London was much, much bigger. Every other parish was maybe 50 families which probably represents more the kind of size of parishes that Eastern Orthodox are dealing with in Western Europe now. Um, and my father always had a, a secular job. He was a carpenter, yeah? and always a carpenter. And one could actually see that there were other advantages to that the, um, when dealing with a small community like that. With a small community like that, you can know everybody intimately, you know, in much more familial terms, but also, the parish not paying my father meant that um, he wasn't the employee of the, of the church, which also had its it, uh, advantages. You know, this is also my service to the church to be ordained as a minister for, the, for, for this community, um, rather than my paid job. I'm doing it because I want to do it for you, not because I'm paid to do it for you. you know, there, there are different dynamics which can work out. Now, that's the kind of situation I grew up with. Going, um, it also has to be said that most of the priests in that context were not seminary trained. So uh, in my mid-twenties, I ended up going to St. Vladimir Assembly to teach there. And there, almost without exception, the, the priests had all been seminary chain, trained. We've been doing that for, you know, for many, many, many decades. And the priests were expecting to go into a parochial situation in which they would be paid to be a parish priest. Um, now, the seminary training, I think, is absolutely indispensable. That what, it, what it prepares a priest to be able to do, or the other leaders within the church, lay leaders, choir directors, school teachers, I mean, or just generally educated faithful, what it enables them to do, it's so much more um, with a much, much greater understanding than what I've seen elsewhere. So, firm belief in that. Um, it seems within the the OCA within many other jurisdictions in North America, that it is going to be increasingly the case that um, priests will need to find other forms of employment as well in order to be able to sustain their families and, and, and so on. In other communities where there are a thousand families in a community, that's obviously not the, not the case, but it's a very different dynamic going on. So both do have their advantages and disadvantages and we should not remain fixed to one form or the other. The way that, that a particular church travels through history, it mutates in different ways. In Sweden, we have approximately 100 parishes. 80 of these parishes are big, meaning that they uh, sustain their priests for full time, living on a salary, and it's not low, it's quite high for uh, Orthodox priests. Uh, so it means that uh, uh, the major part is uh, education for a living as a priest. 20 parishes are smaller, and we have a two-year education instead of four years for these unemployed priests. Um, if you take the average age, I would say that between 60 and 70 percent of the <coughs> priests, they are about to retire. That's a huge challenge for us. The problem is, as Bishop Suri is well aware of, you cannot wait a long time, you know, you have a certain amount of time before the parish becomes very angry if you don't send the priest. So it means that we have to work quicker than we are able to uh, do in Sweden. So it means that, unfortunately, the result can be that we will not be able in time to produce enough priests. So it means that we'll be importing priests from abroad, it means that integration in society doesn't continue. It means that you know, once you get a priest at the age of 30, for example, you have you know, for maybe 50 years. <laughs> so this, this is a strange situation in Sweden, that we can end up in a situation that we employ, we educate the priests, but they end up in a situation where the place is already filled. 
And it's because it's the same generation of priests, especially in Syria Roman Church, a lot of older priests. And this one other thing is that the major part of priests are not educated at all in theology. At all. Not a single credit, <laughs> not a single unit. They have language and liturgy. They don't even possess the ability to explain basic Christian things. So that's the second thing that you need to educate them after they have been ordained. And everyone knows that it's very hard to educate priests. Yeah. Um, Father Nisko from Ethiopian Orthodox Church. And I'm very happy to be here today because I have learned a lot of experience from two presentations that I have here. And um, for the issue that we need to get yeah, united to uh, Eastern and uh, Oriental Orthodox churches, the only means that we have as we have been you know, saying it again and again is education, to teach them, to shape the way how they have developed their uh, way of life from their own background. Maybe yeah, they have a lot of yeah, information that they have get. So it, the only means that we have is to teach them, to recreate their mind and give them a new way of looking at the world. So what I want to know from, from both you, our presenters, is what serious challenge did you face along the way to build these academic institutions for this extended time? In fact, it was successful, very impressive, and really impressed, especially from the from the Coptic Orthodox Church in Australia. Yeah, it as as you have done it within short time, it looks yeah you have done it in a full carpet way, but definitely there are a lot of challenges that you have faced, yeah, that you have cried before God to solve it. Maybe we haven't heard of it. Maybe tomorrow if you want to do something, what are those challenges that you have definitely confronted? Internally, externally, so that we may be learn from your experience for our future career in the church as well as to build the, church, the academic institution as a hero or something like that. Well. Thank you. I think the biggest challenge for me was trying to convince the community of the importance of theological education. Because for a long time it was neglected in the Coptic Orthodox Church. So if I turn back history a hundred years and see what was happening in the life of the Coptic Church at the turn of the 20th century, in all of Egypt there was one priest who could preach, Father Philithaus Ibrahim Baghdadi. And he would go from Cairo to Alexandria, all the way down south preaching, had these revival uh, uh, um, assemblies. Sorry? Assemblies. Yeah, revival assemblies. Uh, his preaching would sometimes go on for three hours, the church would be packed. People were eager and thirsty to hear the word of God and could not find anyone to preach. There was no patriarch or bishop or priest or lay person that was preaching. The church was dying um, until Habib Gerbis came on the scene. Uh, in his second sermon in Cairo, Pope Cyril V was standing on his throne blessing him with the cross, blessing the congregation, feeling overjoyed that preaching and teaching had come back to the church through this young bright deacon that, that God sent to Egypt at this time. So, and then he, he did obviously a lot of work in theological education throughout his career. But the church still is, hasn't learned the lesson in my opinion. It's just starting to wake up now and realize the importance of theological education. So when I came to Melbourne, there was no theological college. This was, you know, not something that was given attention by clergy, uh, by the church that much. But now slowly, as people begin to realize and they begin enlightened when they come and study, come and open, you know, a patristic text, you know, and learn how to read the patristic text when Father John came last year and 
you know, enlighten our, our students how to go deep into a text and understand it and to really struggle with the text and try to understand what the Patristic Father is saying, people started to see, well, you know, this is useful, this is important, I need to know this, I need to be able to teach this to my children. How am I going to hand down this faith that has been handed down from generation to generation? Have you had the struggle to be able to maintain Coptic identity because of all of these, you know, uh, threats that were tearing at this very th uh, thread of Coptic identity? Well, the same thing is going to happen now in a different milieu if we are not careful to be able to see the importance of continuing this tradition and, and training our young people in particular of the importance of theological uh, education. So slowly the people begin to understand and the more you talk, the, the more you explain. Uh, I think this mindset will, will change and people will start supporting uh, the theological college and you know donating funds to be able to run a theological college because I'm sure Father John can tell you it's a multi-million dollar project to be able to run a proper theological college. Our small college in Melbourne for example which is you know got still a long way to go my budget is three quarters of a million dollars per year to be able to run the college to be able to pay my staff and faculty etc and that's nothing by today's uh, 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 dollars and cents. I think I definitely agree with you, Grace, about the difficulty of persuading people of the need for theological education. Um, or perhaps even to put it slightly differently around, that so many people do not think it important to do what we do at the highest possible level that it can be done. They, it's sufficient just to read a few elementary books, that's all you need to know. The very basic outline of the faith and the rest of the matter just obey and that'll be enough, have faith and obey. No, God has given us minds to be able to think and to be able to answer other people. So we have to use those minds and stretch them as far as we possibly can in our desire to enter into communion with him. No doubt about it. Uh, it doesn't mean that everybody's going to go on to do doctoral work and become great scholars, but everybody should be stretching themselves in the same respect because it's a mark of our, de our desire for God. So the need to do that, yeah, and the reluctance of a great number of people, the disparagement of a great number of people with regard to that. That's also shown by the lack of support we actually get from the institutional church in all of this. Yeah, you know, His Grace has just mentioned what it takes to run a school. <laughs> when, when, when your school really gets up and running, we'll talk again, um, because it really is a huge amount uh, to run that school for the benefit of all, and then how disappointing it is not to actually have the church leaders stand behind the school and help finance it or raise money for the parish and so on. And then with regard to challenges and uh, disappointments that you asked about, the other one would be is um, the disparagement that is thrown at us for promoting Eastern Oriental unity. Mm. Yeah? The, I, I think that disband, disband is actually lessening now than it was in previous years, but nevertheless, it's still there. You try and suggest something, and people will, will, will start naysaying it immediately before they even start to think about it. Yeah. I think that uh, the Orthodox Church is a hierarchical church. It means that I think that the, whole, the bishops are like antennas of the Holy Spirit. But the people being baptized are like the television sets. They are the ones reflecting the, what comes from this antenna. So uh, the bishops need to uh, tune in to this wavelength that is the church tradition and so forth of the people. But once the television sets are, you know, uh, giving the message, they begin to talk with each other also. And suddenly bishops lose control of what's happening. And in order to create a facilitated development, it needs an institutionalization of learning. It means that there has to be a middle layer between the bishop and the people. That's the theological institutions. 
The problem with the Oslo Church is we have a very hard time to institutionalize. It's not just to build a seminary, like Bishop Suri already knows. It's also how to give it a meaning, how to uh, ground it in the life world of a church. And that's a supreme responsibility by the bishops. And actually, in order to produce a good and uh, viable edu theology education, it needs the support of by the bishops. It needs the interest by the bishops. It needs also the community of bishops, because it's above the diocesan level to have good theological seminary. But it cannot be the mind of the bishop. Then it becomes too small. It needs to be larger than the mind of the bishops. And then, this is the way institutionalization has to be built. And we have a lot to learn. The Catholic Church is way ahead of us concerning this. Uh, we have to find our way of dealing with it. It has to be different from what the Roman Catholic Church is doing, and different from the Protestant Church. And to find out the right key for this, it will take an additional decade, at least, in a new here, 30, 40 years ahead. Um, I want to thank our friends from the uh, Sister Institute, so from Melbourne, from Sweden, from New York and Amsterdam, uh, and of course Amsterdam itself, <laughs> uh, for, uh, for being together, coming together, challenging each other, and seeing that there is a lot of work ahead of us uh, but but let's uh, let's continue, um, and um, I also want to thank the Coptic community here in Amsterdam for giving us hospitality here, very warm uh, hospitality. Uh, and of course, I want to thank you for taking the time this beautiful evening to come here and to hear and talk about uh, Orthodox uh, theological uh, education. And last of all. Of course, we want to thank God that this is possible, that we live in a free country where we can practice our faith. Uh, and uh, let's thank God. So I want to ask uh, Archbishop Polycarpus to end the evening with a prayer. Since you got an ecoptic sent, I'm going to begin a ecoptic prayer. Genefran, Emefiot, Nemabsheri, Nemabnev, Maesola, Benot, Benot. Amen. We thank you, O Lord, for all the lessons that you bestowed upon us. We thank you for the clergy and the professors and theological education that's blossoming in our churches. Bless those who teach and bless the students and send more laborers to work in your vineyard. And may all the work that we do be for the glory of your holy name. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and we will be to the trespasses. As we forgive those who trespass against us, and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and